morning church as we gather together on this the Lord's day. Tim our pastor is taking time out to charge his batteries. Uh, he's been very very busy and by God's grace he's brought some tremendous words to us which have uh, hopefully uh, been of value to uh, transform our lives uh, to the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, please pray for Tim. Uh, he does need to uh, charge his batteries. He does uh, need uh, to take time out. I can uh, only ask uh, for your prayers for Tim as uh, he, he is taking uh, a day or two uh, just to have a look at, at where God would have him to be and what the message for the church at this time is. We're going to have a look at uh, Deuteronomy chapter 8. Uh, as a prison to uh, look at the times in which we live at this present time. Let's pray. Father, we look to you, our God, our King, because you are the Holy One. There is none beside you. You are glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders. And we bow our hearts before you this on the Lord's day. Lord, we need to hear from you. Lord, the, uh, these words that will be spoken by this poor man, Father, are not enough. We need to hear from the Holy Ghost. Touch our hearts, open the power of your precious word that we might know where we stand in these days, that we might indeed be to you a praise and a glory in the earth. Bless your church at this time, our God and our King, we pray to the glory of the name and the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Now the times in which we live, are unprecedented. There is no doubt about that. At no other time in human history uh, do we find where the whole world, except for a few island nations, has been subject to a virus so virulent and deadly as to cause whole nations to lock down borders and peoples. Not only be to, to be subject to these restrictions, but also to have the economies of the nations to be put on hold with the financial institutions and stock markets severely hit. On top of all of this, the church buildings have been closed with no gathering of God's people together. And what we have here, friends, is the humbling of the nations and of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the only answer to all of this is repentance. We need to have a change of heart and a change of mind about God. This event has been long coming with the extent of the wickedness of the nations that not only pursue things unseemly, unrighteous and unholy, but to teach these things to children, to the innocents. Matthew 18.6 says, But whoso shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and that he were drowned in the depth of the sea. Matthew 18.10, a little bit further, Matthew says, Take heed that you despise not one of these little ones, for I say unto you that in heaven their angels do always behold the face of my Father which is in heaven. We must have no mistake about it, friends, that God's judgments will never ever fail. Isaiah 3.15 says, What mean ye that you beat my people to pieces and grind the faces of the poor, saith the Lord God of hosts? Isaiah 5.20 says, Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. declared that the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. Deuteronomy 8, 1 to 5 is a place of humility. It's a time of testing. 40 in the Bible always speaks of a time of testing. It's a time of humbling, a time of proving. Now the world is where the world is. But this is just where the church of the Most High God is, in a time of testing and a time of proving. 
Only in times of great trials were the early church separated from each other. And except for the persecuted church, this pandemic is unique because, because it is also the humbling of the nations and the church. Deuteronomy 8 shall be speaking to all of us, including the speaker. For years, many of us have been attending church because that's what Christians do, right? Well, if that's correct, why do we find in Revelations 2 in Ephesus, as we've heard from Tim, the first church to be preached on in the seven churches? Going to church, doing everything right, everything right, a commendation from the Lord that they did well. And then he goes on to say, but I have this one thing against you. You've left your first love. And he goes on to say, repent. We have been doing the same in our church. I've been doing the same. And when we closed the buildings down, there were so many people upset. So many people were, were distressed, crying. And when I spoke to uh, one or two folk, I said to them, which is more important, church or Jesus? And why is that important? Well, there's a parable. When people are knocking at the door. And they say, Lord, Lord, let us in. And Jesus said, go away. I, I don't know you. And they said, Lord, we've been doing your work. We've been doing this and we've been doing that. And we've been casting out devils. And Jesus said to them, go away. I never knew you. You see, from that, we have to deduct that the important thing is not, do we know Jesus? But does Jesus know us? With this present lockdown, our God has given unto his church a wonderful opportunity to seek his face. In Jeremiah 29, 13, it says, And ye shall seek me and find me when your heart shall search for me with all your heart. There's an opportunity to come close to God that we've never had before. To go to church and to fellowship and to worship and to hear the word of God is good. It's good. But friends, it's as though we had church and Jesus was an, a lock on to it. It was a, um, an add-on. Jesus was an add-on to the church. That is not supposed to be how it is. We should be going to church to seek God's face, to know of the Lord Jesus Christ. And as, as Jacob, Jacob Prash says, what happened to Abraham happened to Israel and happens to the church. And here in Deuteronomy 8, we see the Lord working out his grace in the hearts of Israel. They had nowhere to go. They were totally reliant on him. How would we do in that situation? How would we fare in that situation? Because that is exactly where we are. We're in this lockdown, we don't have others that we can fellowship with in that sense. We have no building that we can have open to us that we might gather together. And all we have, friends, is God. And if we don't find God now, we're going to be in a state. In our infinite mind, we cannot begin 
to grasp the infinite mind of Almighty God. We cannot be, begin to understand the glory that is God, the majesty that is God. Look at the list of his gracious activities and how he led his people. How he's been to Israel all that they should ever require. And so to the church too. You see, friends, we should never require anything else but God. If God isn't first, he's nowhere. If Jesus isn't Lord of all, he's not Lord of anything. Deuteronomy 8, 2. It says, And there thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these forty years in the wilderness to humble thee and to prove thee <clears throat> and to know what is in thine heart, whether thou wouldst keep his commandments or no. Verse 3 says, And he humbled thee and suffered thee to hunger and fed thee with manna, which thou knewest not. Neither did thy fathers know, that he might make thee know that man doth not live by bread only, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. And in verse 2 and 3, we are taken back to the Garden of Eden. Adam was totally and utterly reliant on God. He met with God every day in the cool of the evening. And then sin entered into Adam. And he hid. And God came looking for his friend Adam. And God said, Adam, where are you? Because he wasn't where he was supposed to be. And now, friends, listen. Listen. Church, listen. Not a cry, nor a call, but a whisper. Adam, where are you? What's gone wrong? And God is calling us, not as a gathering of a church, no matter how big that might be, or how small that might be. As individuals, the whisper is, Adam, where are you? What's gone wrong? You see, we find that the Lord is not so interested in what we do. But what is in our hearts and what our intent is. Whether we will keep his word or not. Why? Why is that important? Well, because we are not our own. We belong to Jesus. We belong to him by creative right. He fashioned and made us. And we belong to him. And having found us in sin and unrighteousness, he redeemed us by the precious blood of the Lamb. And so now he owns us not by creative right, he also owns us by redemptive right. We belong to him. And as it was here in Deuteronomy 8 with the children of Israel, when they complained and they moaned about the way God was leading them by Moses and by Aaron. And we have to say, friends, shall the clay say to the potter, what are you doing? And listen, friends, we have no right to question God in the way that he deals with us. If God wasn't serious about righteousness and holiness, the Ten Commandments would have been ten suggestions. 
We have to say that the Christian life is not difficult. It's impossible. Only Jesus can live it. Colossians 1.27, it's Christ in you, the hope of glory. In Romans 8 verse 1, it says there is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set us free from the law of sin and death. And again, Paul writes in Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And that the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loves me, and who gave himself for me. Friends, we have been set free to worship him and to allow him the rightful place on the throne of our heart. We find that no sooner had, had uh, Israel came out of Egypt than the dissat dissatisfaction came, the displeasure came, the disappointment started. Israel had been praying 400 years to be set free. And yet just in a, in a few weeks, they rebelled. I mean, God had delivered them by blood. On the, the lintel and the doorpost speaks of the cross. And then God led them through the, the Red Sea, which is baptism in water. Then came the golden calf. After Moses had spent time with God up Mount Horeb. Then came the manna. Then came the quail. Then came the water. And they continually, continually moaned and groaned. Then we see that Korah and Dathan and Abiram rose up against Moses. And the earth opened up and they went alive with all their family and all that they had. They went alive into the pit. Speaks of Ananias and Sapphira in the Acts. When they lied to the Holy Ghost, they died. Now because Korah and Dathan and Ab Abiram <clears throat> um, um, set themselves above Moses. We find a plague breaks out because the people m said that you're not supposed to kill um, the, God's people. And it had to be that Aaron took a censer, stood and put, uh, put incense in it, and he stood between the dead and the living because of the plague. And this gracious God and Lord that we are to serve wants to know from his church, wants to know, do you trust me? Do you believe that I am? And he brings us to a place where he humbles us. And to be humbled it is to bring by any means of distress, hardship, adversities, and lack to lead us to a need of help and dependence upon him and this life is the life to live not another in complete dependence upon God and then he wants to prove us by placing us in situations in life as would drive us to reveal what was in our hearts whether there was a belief in the omnipotence, love and righteousness of God or not. It sounds easy, doesn't it? <laughs> it sounds easy. But with all of us, friends, with all of us, and there isn't 
anybody left out of this. People fear. We've already heard that Elijah feared Jezebel. David had the blues. In one of the Psalms he said, Why are you cast down, O my soul? Why are you feeling down? And he goes on to give himself the answer, Trust thou in God. But you know, doubts and apprehensions and fears will come. There's an American tribe that used a, an initiation service or ceremony um, when a young uh, lad was to be brought into to be a brave. And the young lad would be taken uh, by some uh, braves uh, uh, into a forest <clears throat> and sit him down in a small clearing. The lad was to get his own uh, wood and, and logs and he was to make his own fire and if he wanted any food he had to cook it. <clears throat> and that was great when it was light and he lit the fire and then the night started to draw in and the young lad got fearful. He could hear things. He could hear rustlings in, in the woods and the breaking of twigs and everything was running through his head. And in a set of bushes, in a, in a few bushes, he saw an image and he thought, what's that? Is that one of the big cats that, uh, that might come and, and jump out at me like a puma? And all night he kept feeding the fire and feeding the fire that it blazed ever, ever bigger. And then he, he fell asleep through exhaustion. And, and when he woke up, the fire had gone out and it wasn't quite light. And he looked at the bush and the, the image was still there and he thought, I've had it. And then the sun came up and the young lad was very glad. And he could see this image a little clearer. And as the sun rose and fully shone upon this, these set of bushes, he saw that the image got clearer. It was his dad. His father had been in the bushes all night to protect and to cover and to bless the lad. How much more will our Heavenly Father do for us than that Indian father looking after his son? Verse 3 says the humiliation of the wilderness was not merely that God left the people hungry and want of bread and their ordinary food, but also in the fact that he fed them with manna. Eating manna was called a humiliation. As we see God demonstrating to his people through this, <clears throat> through this food, which was unknown to them, that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. And this is the message, friends. This is the message. God has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. There's nothing that is left out. He's even given of his own son that we might live a life before him and be a blessing to him. You see, the power to sustain life does not rest on bread only. Jesus picks this up in Matthew 6. At the end of Matthew 6, he talks about Solomon and all his glory, and then goes on to say the lilies of the field are more glorious than Solomon. Talks about the birds of the air, they don't sow, they don't reap, they have no barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Why do you seek the things that are only temporal, and neglect the things that are eternal. Jesus goes on to say, listen, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. We go back to Ephesians 2. 
We have to get our priorities right. God taught them that the good things he designed for them were figures of better things and that the happiness of man doesn't consist in what we have, what's in the house, the size of the car, the, the, the price of the property, being clothed in, in Savile Row suits. In the days of Israel, whether they're clothed in purple or fine linen or what, whatever they ate, wasn't the issue. But by being taken into covenant and communion with God and then having confidence in his word to guide and to, to have his presence with us to protect us. Friends, godliness and contentment is great gain. In verse 4, we see that the Lord provided for their nourishment and so did he in a marvellous way for the clothing of his people during these 40 years. It says in, <clears throat> in verse 4, Thy garment did not fail, or oh, sorry, thy, thy garment did not fall off thee through age, and thy foot did not swell. In a parallel verse in Deuteronomy 29, it says their sandals were not worn out. And these words, words show us something more than clothes and shoes that never failed. You see, the children of Israel always had the material. They always had wool and hide and leather and other kinds of material in various amounts for clothes and shoes, which show that their clothes did not wear out upon them nor fail or fall in shreds from their backs because God gave them a miraculous durability. What a mighty God who so provides in miraculous power the needs of his people. Friends, we will never um, get to the bottom, to the depths of God's goodness for his people. He supplies us with all things that ever we need. Forget your wants. Look to God for your needs. It gives the impression that as the younger generation grew up, their clothes also grew on their backs. That's the impression that he gives. In verse 5, it's, <clears throat> in this way, our Father and our God humbled and proved his people. And God is doing this right now. If we will come before God, bow our hearts, open our hearts to him and, and surrender everything that you are to him. We should do that, that we might learn what is in our hearts as God would learn what is in the hearts of the children of Israel. To be convinced by experience that God was educating them and us too as a father does a son. Got to lay everything on the line here. We're at the end of the age. and We see that uh, uh, it brings out <clears throat> uh, a chastisement and rebuke. And to chastise, <clears throat> it means with words and nothing else with words. It means to instruct and to correct, to teach and to educate. You see, friends, it includes everything belonging to a proper education. In 2 Timothy 3.16, 3, Timothy it says all scripture is given by inspiration of God and it is profitable, listen, for doctrine, that is teaching, for reproof, reproof <clears throat> to actually stand, uh, make us stop and think about what we're doing, for correction, for instruction in unrighteousness. The word of God is the first thing that we should turn to when things are going wrong. Because you won't find the answer anywhere in the world. It's lost its way. It's gone. There are people in the world that need to be saved. Yes. But the world itself is lost. So what is God's purpose here 
with Israel. And what is the message for the church? Well, God's looking for a people who will love him and trust him and obey him and be confident in the word of his grace. Obedience, friends, is very important. It was important <clears throat> to Saul, should have been important to Saul. When Samuel said to him, wait until I come to you, and Samuel delayed, and Saul took it upon himself to sacrifice sheep. He made of himself a king and a priest. There's only one king and priest, and that's Jesus Christ. And Samuel said to him, obedience is better than sacrifice. We can give all that we have, every last penny. But if we're not obeying the word of God, it's all a waste of time. We may as well just go home if we're not willing to listen to what God says and do it. This gracious Lord of glory wants to pour the abundance of his blessing upon the church. He's a good God. He is a good father. Abba, father, is good beyond measure. And God in his love and his mercy and his grace wants a people to trust him, to be in heaven with him, because he knows the wonders of heaven. He knows the glories that await us in this inheritance that is granted to his church through Jesus Christ. We are co-heirs with Christ. Marvellous. And he doesn't want anyone to go to hell. God does not delight in the death of the wicked friends. He doesn't dare lost to him. He doesn't want anyone to go to hell. You see, he knows what it's like. He created it, but it was created not for man. It was created for the devil and the fallen angels. Now they have no choice but to go. But man has a choice. We can choose to believe God, or we can choose to go the other way. Let's have a look at verses six to nine. Therefore, thou shalt keep the commandment of the Lord thy God to walk in his ways and to fear him. For the Lord thy God bringeth thee into a good land, a land of brooks of water, of fountains and depths that spring out of the valleys and hills, a land of wheat and barley and vines and fig trees and pomegranates, a land of oil, olive and honey, a land wherein thou shalt eat bread Without scarceness, thou shalt lack, n thou shalt not lack anything in it. A land whose stones are iron, and out of whose hills thou mayest dig brass. And this has two <clears throat> two points to it. Yes, it's a land that, that that is given of God. It's a land of of milk and honey. An abundance of things that God has for Israel. But it also has a spiritual dimension to it. We see that the first two that God says that will be there is wheat and barley. And both speak of bread. Barley, in actual fact, we read recently, had to do with Gideon. How God gave Gideon the victory over the Midianites and the Amalekites and the people from the east. With 300 men, God scattered three armies. Amazing. And of course, bread equals the word of God. And the wheat speaks of the finest of the wheat. That 
is for mankind, is for the church. And barley was a, a bread for the poor people. And so we have the finest of the wheat to the poor. And then we have the vine. Friends, to be one with Jesus as the branch. And with great reverence and fear, we must realize that Jesus calls us friends and has the greatest who has the greatest honour, allowing us to be branches in him, as in a vine. Now we must accomplish what we should be in our lives if we are branches of the vine of Christ. We must release ourselves unto the Lord Jesus Christ. John 15, 5 says, I am the vine, Jesus speaking, you are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. And there are people that are running around, or were running around, doing churchy things. Without having Christ at the forefront. And they are taking the glory to themselves. They would have people pat them on the back for what they are doing. And God didn't get a look in. Then we move on to the fig trees. First of all, we see the figs in the Garden of Eden. And they covered up the shame of Adam and Eve. Their leaves did. In fact, it's the only tree that's specified that we know for sure was in the garden. The other two trees, we don't know what kind of trees they were. It's not specified in the garden. And throughout the scriptures, the plant, the, <coughs> the, the, the fig plant, <coughs> becomes a symbol of prosperity, of well-being and security. Then we have the pomegranate. The pomegranate, in the, uh, <coughs> we find, is, is in, the, in the robe of the high priest, sewn on the bottom of his vesture in Exodus 28, 33. And it says, make pomegranates of blue, of purple and scarlet yarn around the hem of the robe with gold bells between them. And as the high priest walked around with the blue and the purple and the scarlet, he was speaking of blue for heaven Purple, which is a combination of blue and, and red, which speaks of blood, scarlet yarn. And the scarlet yarn speaks of Jesus. And all three speak of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the Lord of heaven. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And he is the only one, <clears throat> the only name whereby is given unto, uh, unto men, whereby we must be saved. And the bells were for praise as the high priest walked around the bells tinkled and that speaks of praise and the pomegranate speaks for fruit and then we have oil olive speaks of the holy spirit in hebrews 1 9 it says you have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness therefore god your god has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your Companions, speaking of Jesus Christ, speaking of the anointing of the Holy Ghost upon him. In the tabernacle, the oil was for the uh, lampstand and it gave light. Speaks of two things again. For the lampstand is the Lord Jesus Christ with his church. And the light <coughs> speaks of the words that Jesus Christ said, that we are to be the light of the world. We have to shine, friends, when we can. We have to shine to show forth that we belong to the living God. The stones that uh, uh, the, the Word of God speaks about <clears throat> speaks of iron for judgment. Iron always speaks of judgment and punishment and war and brass. Brass speaks uh, of where God's judgment deals with sin. We see that this, um, in the tabernacle of the wilderness, the, the outer court, the, the posts were, were actually uh, put in 
in sockets of brass. God always speaks of brass. The, the, um, the altar for sacrifice was a brazen altar. Judgment begins, friends, <clears throat> with the house of the Lord. And God's judgment deals with sin. And only then can a person enter the pure and the holy presence of God. Too many people want Pentecost before the cross. Too many people want to rise up without going down. Too many people are looking for a way, an easy way, an easy path to the blessings of God Almighty. It says there is a land without scarceness. Without scarceness. And this is what God is, is about. To have a people unto himself that he might love and care and protect and have unto himself. This is where Adam and Eve were in the garden. Without scarce, they had no scarceness. And then sin came in. And now, through Adam, man is unregenerate. But through Jesus Christ, we can become the redeemed of the Lord, washed in the precious blood of the Lamb, a people who are forgiven of their debt, and now a people of praise. John 10.10, 10, famous verse, the thief comes not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that you might have life and that they may, might have it more abundantly. God is an abundant God. He has not withdrawn anything. In fact, the gifts and callings of God are without repentance. God deals with us in an abundant way, friends, but we cannot approach God in a way that suits us. Ephesians 3.20 says, Now unto him, that's Jesus, that is able to do exceedingly, exceedingly abundantly, above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, unto him, be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. You see, the blessings that God has for us, who are the heirs of promise, friends, they are not to be heaped unto ourselves. Any gifts of calling are not to personal pleasure. Any blessings in temporal and temporal things of finance or of of uh, of uh, uh, giftings from God are not to be heaped upon ourselves. Every gift, whether spiritual or temporal, belongs to him. You see, if we do it to ourselves, it will bring us into condemnation. God has given unto the church of the firstborn from the dead all things that pertain to life and godliness. But let us not forget that we cannot have God on our own terms. He's sovereign. He's the Lord Almighty. He is the King of glory. There's no one like unto him. And if we submit ourselves as we bow our hearts before him and lay everything down, any gifting that we have, whether it be of, of an apostle or, or, or an evangelist or, or a, um, a prophet or past, a pastor or a teacher, whatever giftings we have, whatever God has given to us, we should regularly bring them to God and submit them to him and give them back. And if God wants us to take them up again, then we take them up. But it is his perfect will and purpose. Deuteronomy 8, 10 to 16 says, When thou hast eaten and art full, then thou shalt bless the Lord thy God for the good land which he has given thee. How many of us, I wonder, how many of us, I wonder, 
will actually give God the glory when we receive a blessing from God. And not just earthly things, but spiritual things. How many of us will, will humble ourselves to give him the glory? Verse 11 says, Beware that thou forget not the Lord thy God in not keeping his commandments and his judgments and his statutes, which I command thee this day. Lest when thou hast eaten and art full and hast built goodly houses and, and dwelt therein. When we become self-sufficient, friends, when we become proud in what we've done and where we are, we may have a position in church and we take upon ourselves a mantle that doesn't belong to us. We have to be very, very careful. Deuteronomy 13 goes on, And when thy herds and thy flocks multiply, and thy silver and thy gold is multiplied, and all that thou hast is multiplied, then thy heart be lifted up, and thou forget the Lord thy God, which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. When we've got so much, In Luke 12, there's a, a parable of a farmer. <clears throat> he had a tremendous harvest. <clears throat> he had to pull some barns down and build some bigger barns. <clears throat> and after that, he, he stored all his, his goods and he said, Now, soul, eat, drink, and be merry. And God said to him, Thou fool, thy soul will be required of thee this night. He was going to die. And he hadn't got the presence of mind to give God the glory that when he did die, he would go to the right place. This is where the prosperity gospel fails. It's here. It's here. We can have all the wealth. All of it. Paul says in another place, <clears throat> he said, what does it matter? What does it matter if you gain the... No, Jesus, sorry, I do apologise. It's Jesus said, what does it matter if, if you gain the whole world and lose your soul? What profit is it? Paul knew. Paul knew that he had lack. He said that I have lacked. And I know what it is to have plenty. I know what it is to be full, and I know what it is to be empty. And in all things, friends, we are to look to the Lord God of Israel. There's no one else. Paul did it every time. <coughs> Paul knew who was his God. I've run the race, he said. Goes on to say in verse 15 of <coughs> Deuteronomy 8, who led thee through this that great and terrible wilderness, wherein <clears throat> were fiery serpents and scorpions and drought, where there was no water. There was no water in the wilderness. And then he goes on to say, who brought thee forth water out of the rock of flint. This relates to Jesus because it says of Jesus, he set his face as a flint towards Jerusalem. Who fed thee in the wilderness with manna, which thy fathers knew not, that he might humble thee, and that he might prove thee to do thee good at thy latter end. We forget God too easy, friends. We forget the God of goodness, the God of mercy, the God of long suffering, the God of patience. And we forget, friends. That he is a covenant-keeping God. He is faithful when we are faithless. Precious and holy. Tremendous God. Lovely. And we are not to forget God in the hard times and in the good times. We are to keep ourselves before God. That he might do to us and with us as is good pleasure. 
It goes on in Deuteronomy 8, 17. And thou say in thine heart, my power, my power and the might of mine hand hath gotten me this wealth. What pride. The people would say this when God has given all he has got. And we would turn around and say, it's me that's done this. It's a church that, that, that grows from small, small acorns, if you like, and grows into a massive oak tree. And the people in the church say, we've done this. We've done it. That's wickedness, that is. Where, where's God going to be with, in that church? Verse 18, he said, but thou shalt remember the Lord thy God. For it is he that giveth thee the power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant, which he swore unto thy fathers, as is this day. God keeps covenant, not us. It's God's covenant, not ours. It's ratified in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we need to know that he is in control. There is nothing in heaven and earth that moves without God has given his permission. Nothing. And it shall be, verse 19, if thou do all forget the Lord thy God and walk after other gods and serve them and worship them, I testify against you this day that ye shall surely perish. Don't take it for granted. Salvation, do not take it for granted. Do not. The Bible says we cannot serve God and mammon. We cannot serve ourselves and serve God. The first command, hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God first, foremost, with heart and soul and might and strength. All that we have, God is looking for all that we are. Portions don't matter to God. If we're not given wholly unto God, then we are not given unto him at all. Verse 20 says, As the nations which the Lord destroys before your faith, so shall ye perish. My word. My word. That we should be a people knocking at the door like the five foolish virgins. Knocking at the door. Lord, Lord, let us in. Oh my God. That it should happen like that. That the church should come to that. That the people of God should miss the most important thing. And we need to find out, friends. We need to find out whether we are for Jesus or against him. Is he in our hearts? Are we obeying his word? It goes on to say, because you would not be obedient unto the voice of the Lord your God. When you turn off from the word or you're reading the Bible and you miss out pertinent places and positions in the Bible because it doesn't suit your particular point of view. You are not listening to the voice of the Lord. You are not listening to the Lord Almighty. You're putting your fingers in your ear. And I don't want to know that. Well, God's word is for the church. It's for us. And if we don't obey, if we do not obey the word of the Lord, then judgment comes and we will be destroyed. Friends, let not this be the case of the church of the Lord of glory. Let us come humbly before him. May the Lord help us. May the Lord bless us that, and open our eyes that we might know and see that he indeed is God. He is the Lord of glory and there is none. 
that would lead us out of this wilderness. There is none that we can turn to. Only God. The Lord bless you. Have a good Lord's Day. Amen.